So essentially, we now know that there are probably three main types of antibodies that are important in patients. The first ones are perineoplastic antibodies, as patients who have autoimmunity because they have a tumor and they are reacting against a tumor, but those antibodies that they make cross-react with the nervous system. These perineoplastic antibodies are usually, but not always, to intracellular antigens, which are shared by the tumors. And as a result of this, they, patients don't usually get better if you treat them because those antibodies are biomarker for the presence of the tumor, but not necessarily pathogenic. But there are some exceptions, as I'll tell you. Antibodies that bind to intracellular antigens and are not necessarily perineoplastic. There's one particularly good example, which is glutamic acid decarboxylase, and I'll talk, mention that a little bit in a moment. The ones that are newer are these antibodies that bind to extracellular antigens. These patients who have them often have non-perineoplastic disorders, and they do make a good response to immunotherapies. And so those are the ones that I was hoping to be able to tell you more about. And of course, what I have to do throughout is to tell you about their relevance to cerebellar syndromes. So just to start with the onconeural antibodies, these are so well known that any clinician among you will have already heard about them, but just very briefly, these are antibodies to onconeural antigens found in patients with tumor-related neurological diseases. And you can see the list there. They're all called after the first initials of the patient's first patient's name, which is why you have those funny um, names for them, or some of them. And those are intracellular proteins. And in general, these antibodies were not thought to be pathogenic, and the patients did not improve with immunotherapies. I'm putting this in the past tense because there are always some exceptions. One of the exceptions is amphiphysin, which is an intracellular protein, but for reasons I won't go into, sometimes the patients respond well to immunotherapies. So just to go through the sort of basic ones, which you may have heard about already, but just to show you how they're measured, um, they, sh they bind to antigens on usually rodent brain sections, and you can see up here, binding to the nuclei of certain neurons. This is HU antibody in the cerebellum, there's the Purkinje cells, and in the brain stem. And if you do a western blot of the brain tissue, you see bands at around 35 to 40 kilodalton. And in the initial um, experiments done by Joseph Dalmar and um, Jerry Posner and others, you can take these, sequence them, and find out what the antigen is. And that's what they did. And these antibodies are associated with small cell lung cancer, sensory neuropathies, and often cerebellar ataxia. So this is an important one in ataxia. There's another antibody, anti-yo, which is also important and particularly important for cerebellar ataxia. It's not quite so common anyway. And the patients usually have gynecological or breast tumors. The antigen is called yo, and you can see now that it's the cytoplasm of the Purkinje cells that is most um, labeled with the patient's antibodies to the yo protein. So that's what most people did in the 90s, but in the, uh, about 10 years ago, it became possible to do line blots. So these are like little Western blot strips. You can buy these. They're relatively expensive, but if you're careful, you can cut each one into two so that you can double the number of tests you can do with each packet of strips. And they will tell you which antibodies the patients have got. And they're expanding all the time. So this is sort of multiplex testing for perineoplastic antibodies, and it's really quite efficient and usually correct. There was a lovely antibody called TR, which is particularly interesting because it's associated with Hodgkin's lymphoma almost exclusively and cerebellar ataxia in those patients. And this was a really exciting one to see on, on brain sections because you, you can see not only the Purkinje cells, but these axons, and also lots of dots around in the molecular layer. And everybody could recognize this, but 
we only found them about once a year from testing hundreds of patient samples, so it's pretty uncommon. It's only recently, 10 years later, that the actual antigen was discovered um, by Peter Sulevis Schmidt and his colleagues in Holland, and it is actually an extracellular protein, not an intracellular one. The antibodies bind to extracellular domains, it's expressed on Purkinje cells, and one might well think that this antibody would be pathogenic because it's binding to the outside of a membrane protein on the Purkinje cells, but so far most of the patients have not done very well with treatment. Perhaps they need to be caught early before any damage has been done by the antibodies. Now, I want to go to this antibody which so many people talk about in cerebellar ataxia nowadays, which is the GAD antibody. This is glutamic acid decarboxylase. So this is an intracellular enzyme which, of course, is responsible for making the inhibitory transmitter GABA. Because the antigen is in intracellular, we assume that the antibodies do not cause the disease because they cannot reach it in normal healthy cells. But in um, 2001, Chess Grouse and some of us from around Europe helped to publish this paper where we found 14 patients with GAD antibodies and cerebellar ataxia. Unfortunately, they were already well-developed cases, all of them more than two years duration. They had high ranking scores, that's the modified ranking scores for severity. They had severe ataxia, gait and limbic involvement, nystagmus and dysarthria. So they were badly affected. And most of them had cerebellar atrophy on MRI. So the cerebellum had already been damaged by either the GAD antibodies or maybe an associated immune attack. What's more, these were very autoimmune type patients because a high proportion of them had other tissue antibodies with evidence of polyendocrine syndromes, mainly thyroiditis or diabetes. So all of this suggests that they are patients who react autoimmune-wise to various challenges. And therefore, probably the GAD antibodies are actually a secondary effect of the damage to the Purkinje cells. That would make some sort of sense. Therefore, the antibodies would not be causing the disease. Nevertheless, they seem to be a biomarker for an autoimmune type of cerebellar ataxia. And personally, I think what we need to do is to find those antibodies as quickly as possible in patients who develop ataxia, have the preliminary signs of ataxia, and if you find them, treat them reasonably aggressively with immunotherapies in the hope that it will prevent the otherwise inevitable progression of disease. So I'm going to turn now to something which is slightly different. So this is the Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. This is an antibody-mediated disease of the nerve muscle junction and on the face of it, nothing to do with the cerebellum. This patient had onset of difficulty in walking. He had lung cancer diagnosed two years later. He had been a smoker, heavy smoker. He had proximal muscle weakness, depressed reflexes, post potentiation, and also autonomic features with a dry mouth, constipation, and erectile dysfunction. And what he had was voltage-gated calcium channel antibodies. And we know from many studies that we and others did in the 90s and 80s, that these antibodies do cause the disease. They bind at the nerve muscle junction to the proximal nerve terminals and they prevent the release of the transmitter acetylcholine and that causes the symptoms in the muscle and similar symptoms in the autonomic nervous system. But this is an antibody that is worth looking at for in cerebellar ataxia. Here are the antibody levels in patients with this Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. And here are antibodies in patients who have a small cell lung cancer associated cerebellar ataxia. And you see that the antibody levels are reasonably high in the patient's serum, 
They are also present in the CSF here, although if you look at the axes here, there's, a, I think, an 80-fold difference in the range in the CSF. But nevertheless, that is considerable, and it's more than would get into the cerebral spinal fluid just by diffusion. So some of the antibodies being made within the brain compartment. All of this points to the idea that these antibodies might be causing the ataxia because they combine to the outside of calcium channels on the Purkinje cells and therefore the patients might respond to treatment. And here are two patients who were particularly interesting. They were Oxford cases. They had cerebellar ataxia and they had high levels of these voltage-gated calcium channel antibodies. First was a male, non-smoker. He was ataxic and weak. He had these antibodies. There was no cancer detected and he improved clinically on plasma exchange. Great. Next one was a female, 30s, non-smoker, severe ataxia, some muscle weakness but not paid much attention to, high calcium channel antibodies, no cancer. Plasma exchange did not improve her ataxia, but nevertheless she improved because she had better muscle function. So both of those patients had the lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome as well as the cerebellar ataxia, and the treatment of the lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome with plasma exchange, which removes antibodies from the circulation, was sufficient to make them feel better, and one of them got out of their wheelchair because they felt strong enough to stand. So just that test actually could make a difference to those patients. And I wish more people thought of that when they see patients with um, a, an onset of cerebellar ataxia that they can't explain. So LEMS was present, but it wasn't recognised initially, but it improved with the immunotherapies and the patients felt better. So there's also, of course, a lot of talk about, well, there is a lot of talk about gliadine and anti-endomesial antibodies, as they were called in those days usually found in celiac disease, measured by ELISA's and immunohistochemistry, and found in a, quite a high proportion of patients with cerebellar ataxia. I could never work out what the relationship with the neurological disease was, whether there was a pathogenic mechanism or not, um, but the symptoms improved after gluten-free diet. Um, I know Mar Marios Hadjivasilio is here, and I'm not going to say any more about these antibodies. I expect he's got some data to show you. But in the, 90, in the late 90s and early 2000s, we collected some samples and wanted to know how many of them had these antibodies. And these were all patients whose samples had been referred to us with ataxia written on the referral form. You can see only one of them had HU antibodies, Four had geoantibodies with the relevant gynecological cancers. There were RI antibodies and TR antibodies in one each. But three had VGCC, voltage-gated calcium channel antibodies, and four had GAD antibodies, and two transglutaminase. So actually, non-perineoplastic forms of ataxia were picked up in those patients when we did the appropriate assays. And one does just think that perhaps we should be doing more of these. This is uh, just a Venn diagram. If anybody wants to take a picture, it's probably a good one to take because it just gives you an overview of what I've told you. But I'm not going to go through it in detail. So how common are these perineoplastic um, cases of cerebellar degeneration? Well, quite frankly, not really. Very common. This was a European, EU-funded network um, led by Bruno Geometta, who is in Padua and Treviso. Um, and he and colleagues all over Europe collected a thousand patients with clinical data from 20 centres over eight years. And that means most centres were only seeing one and a half patients a year, unless I've done my son's problem. Mm -hmm. So they're not common. Or maybe, sorry, that, that applies to cerebellar degeneration. One and a half patients with cerebellar degeneration. 
about six patients a year with perineoplastic disorders. But cerebellar degeneration is the most important and the most frequent of these conditions, as you can see up here, in about 25% of patients overall. So they're not common, but it's still an important disease to recognize. So now I want to turn to the new era since the sort of mid 2000s. This is the era of antibody mediated immunotherapy responsive diseases. So, which antibodies can we measure? Which syndromes are they associated with? And how common is ataxia in these patients? Well, curiously, it started with another peripheral nerve disease. This one is called peripheral nerve hyperexcitability or acquired neuromyotonia. It's spontaneous muscle activity due to peripheral nerve hyperexcitability. Some of the patients have some CNS involvement. It's quite mild usually, but it makes one wonder whether the antibodies that they have can possibly reach the brain. And it certainly improves after platinum exchange. We found that 40% of the patients had antibodies that could precipitate botrytated potassium channels, not calcium channels this time. We then realized subsequently, and it took a little while to do this, that what we thought were antibodies binding directly to the potassium channels, which are tetramers on the surface of, of the nerves, they were binding instead to other proteins of a part of a complex which holds the potassium channel in place on the, on the membrane surface of the axon and also in the brain and sinus. So the antibodies are really against these other proteins of which LGI1 and Casper 2 are the main ones. In fact, Casper 2 antibodies are the most common in neuromyotonia, that condition I just showed you, and also can be found in patients with cerebellar infects. As I'll show you in a moment. Lipid encephalitis with these photoscaping potassium channel complex antibodies, as we call them, is a much better known disorder. You can see it here. MRI changes in the medial temporal lobes where the hippocampi are. They have seizures, they have psychiatric features, and amnesia. The amnesia can be very dense, very complete for recent events. About 10% of them do have ATEX. And among these diseases, this is perhaps one of the most common. Probably in the UK, we see about 150 new cases each year. They're not only new, they're incident cases, because when you treat the patients with immunotherapies, that's an exchange in steroids, and intravenous immunoglobulins, they get better and they get home. So it's not a disease you have to keep growing. <coughs> The antibody levels to the potassium channel complex are shown up here. But now we found out that this antibody was much more commonly associated with this protein called LGI1. And in fact, LGI1 has a remarkable job of somehow linking pre and postsynaptic membranes and synapses in the central nervous system. It doesn't seem to be terribly well expressed in the, in the cerebellum, and I'm not sure that it has a particular role. But some of the patients who have this limbic encephalitis have CASPER 2 antibodies, which if you remember is the other protein here. And that probably is why they get ataxia in some patients. Because partly by um, following up on one particular patient who had limbic encephalitis and ataxia, we were able to do some experiments to show that the patient's antibody bound to um, cerebellar tissue. And we did a pull down with the patient's antibodies and we looked for the antigen, which had come down here on the blocks. And slightly disappointingly, we found it was Casper 2. That is an antigen that we already knew about, so we hadn't actually discovered anything. And in fact, the antibody levels weren't terribly high but they were definite, according to our cell-based assays. And these patients, there were eight of them, they were females, they had very long set progressions and durations. Immunotherapies had not been attempted because the patients had presented ages before we did this um, experiment. 
But my theory is that in Catholic antibodies are found in patients with subacute onset of ataxia, immunotherapies could or should be tried. And there's a little bit of evidence for that from other studies. And there's been a study recently of Catholic II antibody associated diseases from Barcelona. And out of 38 patients with Catholic II antibodies, one third of them had cerebellar features. Usually they had other symptoms, and in fact only three had strictly cerebellar presentations. Nevertheless, there were some, they didn't usually have tumours, and they all made a good response to immunotherapy. So that was very encouraging. And also there's been a very interesting paper from the Lyon group of Jérôme Honora. Um, Bastien Joubert here is um, leading on a study of autoimmune episodic ataxia, so that should wake you up. So this is much more like the genetic form of episodic ataxia, but the patients have Casper II antibody associated encephalitis. <coughs> Started with a 61-year-old man with limited encephalitis and on episodes. by orthostatism and emotions and anger. And they did have limited encephalitis to some extent, but everything resolved with immunotherapies. So a paroxysmal form of cerebellar ataxia should be added to the spectrum of these Casper II antibody syndromes and ought to be responsive to therapies. But again, these conditions are really pretty rare. This is patient from um, the I'm not going to go through it in detail. He's not very ataxic, but he has dysarthria, which, because it's in French and because my French is pretty bad, it's, it seems he's talking perfectly well, but it's certainly not talking as fast as the clinician who is giving him things to repeat. You see, he certainly is a bit dysmetric. French, sure. Yeah, so that's Two, which I think is worth thinking about. NMDA receptor encephalitis is the disease that everybody gets excited about. It's found in young females with ovarian teratomas. The NMDA receptor is expressed in the teratoma tissue, so this is a paraneoplastic disorder where you're making an antibody to the teratoma antigens and those are cross-reacting with NMDA receptors in the brain. And many of the cases are now found to be non paraneoplastic with no tumor discovered. There's males and there are females. Here is one patient, I hope, just to show you because this is what a real autoimmune disease should tell you, which would be like. She was a teenage girl presented with neuropsychiatric features, amnesia, and seizures, no ataxia that we're aware of, but it might not be very easy to tell when you've got a patient like this. Ten days later, she was facial grimacing, which you should be able to see, chewing, choreopatoid limb movements, and she was essentially unconscious at this stage. She didn't respond to pain. Nevertheless, the movements went on relentlessly. She didn't have an ovarian teratoma. She was treated very well by um, Dr. Bastillo in Manchester. She made a complete recovery, went back to school, went to college, and the latest I heard, she's getting married. So that's what an antibody-mediated disease should look like, and some very often does, but not always. The recoveries are not always so good. This child was diagnosed late for very clear and perfectly justifiable reasons, and never, and hasn't made a very good recovery, which she's at school, coping, just not achieving her milestones as well as she should. A very distressing disorder, but with remarkable treatment responses. And there was a paper that came out very recently just saying that gait disturbance is quite a common occurrence in very small children before they develop this disease. So I think pediatricians might be interested in that. And then lastly, this is <coughs> such a striking video, I thought you might like to look. 
Uh, this one, this is antibodies to glycine receptor. And this patient's got what we call progressive encephalomyelitis with rigidity and myoclonus. Um, and these patients do have ataxia. It's not usually the main symptom, but they have a lot of brainstem disturbance, and certainly some of them have ataxia as part of the presentation. But in this case, he was so disabled by this rigidity that he can't really walk anyway. He had a lot of eye movement disorders, which could also be partly um, cerebellar in the function of his nature. So that man went back to work after treatment, went back to work part-time as a prison officer. So it was a treatable condition, although there's often some longer-term disability in the patient. So patients with those glycine receptor antibodies, there are a few children, but they tend to have encephalopathies of a fairly broad um, sense. The brainstem disturbance is quite striking, and the ataxia is part of that. Pain I will point to because I think neurologists don't pay enough attention to it, but that's not for you probably. Those patients do in general make a very good response to immunotherapy, although they often need some pharmacological help to um, go back to work. So just to summarize, this is my last slide. I've listed here, and I've put this is worth taking a photograph of if you, if you need to. Um, these are possible antibody tests in patients with recent onset cerebellar ataxia, particularly if other signs of autism mean clinic or brainstem encephalitis and before cerebellar atrophy has developed. And I think if one took the approach that one would really try and get in early, test for whatever antibodies were possible, and treat on the basis of finding one of these antibodies, it would be worth trying. I'm not saying it would be successful, but I hope it would. So at the top of the typical paraneoplastic ones, which you must look for because they'll tell you about tumors, GAD is certainly worth testing if we can start treating much earlier, I'm sure. There's a new antibody called GFAP. It is an astrocyte antibody. It does seem to be associated to some extent with ataxia, and it's becoming quite common, so in that point of view, it might be worth testing. Photosgated calcium channels and CASPER 2, I think, are definitely on the books. And more antibodies in children. So children with ADEM, which is relatively common in children, <coughs> Now, very frequently have an antibody to MOL, which is myelin oligodendrocyte like a protein, and I think that would be definitely worth testing in children. The red ones are those that are likely to give you a treatment response if you find them early on in the disease. So, for this, we need an autoimmune ataxia chip for multiplex testing, just like you have genetic multi tests. And in fact, there is a company that makes that sort of test, and I think we need to encourage them to be thinking about an ataxia set of antigens that people like yourselves could test, uh, use to test for antigens. Thank you very much. <laughs>